So good evening, everyone. You are on our sacred success call with this very special guest, Barbara Stanny. And I, Bar okay, first you all just have to go to barbarastanny.com to learn about Barbara because she's got a pretty long list of accolades. So in the spirit of time, I will let you read that. But Barbara is a wealth expert. And what I even consider even more, I mean, she knows so much about money and financial health, but is a spiritual expert as well. I attended her sacred success retreat a few weeks ago and it just blew me away. I bought her book, Sacred Success, that just came out. And if you were on this webinar, right when we're done, because I want you to pay attention to the webinar, so don't do it until we're done, <laughs> you need to go to amazon.com or to your local bookstore or wherever you buy books and make sure you get this book because in the space of the time that we have with Barbara, we're going to go over some amazing stuff, but uh, we obviously can't read you the entire book. So make sure you buy the book. But Barbara, um, welcome. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for having me, Elizabeth. I'm just so thrilled. So um, I wanted to start off with a little story of mine, because we, we, and then I want you to tell your story. But so I had said that, set this out in an email, but I just want to remind everybody. I had never read any of your books or didn't really know a lot about you. And my good friend, Kate Northrup, called me last May and said, um, hey, I just registered for the Sacred Success Retreat. And I, I don't know, you just came to my mind and I really think it'd be a good fit. I would love for you to come with me. So I just trusted her opinion so much. I went to the link. It felt right. And I just registered within like 15 minutes of even learning about it. Um, and... A lot happened that during the summer, we were busy, we were traveling, so I hadn't really thought about it. And I was at the USANA convention, and I had this whole idea of this Live Big series flood into my head. I was going to do this, this um, email series just to my blog subscribers, or my email subscribers, about how I've learned to live big. And I was about two weeks into that. I was already um, blogging about it, emailing about it. And I sat down at your workshop, and the cover of this beautiful workbook sitting in front of me said a workbook for playing bigger, for playing way bigger. <laughs> and it was just like, hit me like a ton of bricks. I was in exactly the right place. And the next four days were really transformational. So that's my story about how I got to know Barbara and Sacred Success. But Barbara, in a very short nutshell, how did you come, how did the Sacred Success book come about? Well, I had, I had gotten into the, I was a journalist and I started writing about money because that had been my sticky place growing up. I grew up wealthy. My father told me, the only advice my father ever gave me about money was don't worry, which was great <laughs> um, because he, he, he was the R of H&R Block and I had this big inheritance. And he took care of my money and then I married a man who was a stockbroker. So he took care of everything. Well, what I realized very early in our marriage is that he was a compulsive gambler. And what the insane wow. part is for 15 years, I let him manage the money, even though I knew he was gambling it away, because that's how intimid intimidated and terrified I was with anything financial. And wow. even after our divorce, I decided money's not my thing. I don't want to deal with money. Well, I have this theory now. If you don't deal with your money, your money will deal with you. Mm -hmm. And I got tax bills for a million dollars for back taxes he couldn't didn't pay for illegal deals. And my signature was on everything. My father wouldn't lend me the money. He had left the country, and I knew I had to get smart. I just knew. I just didn't know how. But I swear, when you have a commitment, like a down-to-your-toes commitment, the universe revolves to help you reach your goal. And I was hired. I was a journalist. And I was hired for a freelance project to interview women who were smart with money. And that... It all began there. I not only, it, it just changed my life. I not only got smart enough to manage my own money, but I wrote my first book, Prince Charming Isn't Coming, How Women Get Smart About Money. Yeah. And then I wrote Secrets of Six Figure Women because I wanted to make six figures. And then I wrote the book, Overcoming Under Earning. And I had, I was a six figure woman, but I wanted to make more. I wanted to make seven figures. And it was my journey in writing what I thought was going to be a book about making seven figures is how I discovered sacred success. Yeah, that's amazing. And for those of you listening, Barbara has other books, obviously, um, that I highly recommend as well. And Barbara, you teach, um, 
you teach, I think your stages are it's survival st to stability and stability to affluence. Can you tell me, tell us a little bit more about that? There's three stages of financial development. There's survival, there's stability, and there's affluence. So I had spent most of my career helping women go from survival, which is not enough, to stability, which is enough. And so when I said I wanted to make millions, that meant I was going from stability enough to affluence more than enough. Mm. And I thought it was going to be the same process. But it wasn't. I was going to say, were you right? <laughs> what? Were you right? It was not the same process. It was clearly not the same. And, and I figured this out because what I started doing, I thought, well, if I want to make millions, I'll do what I did to make six figures, and I'll interview women who are making millions. And I did. And it was great fun. I loved the interviews. I had no problem finding women who made millions. With three years of interviews, I had no, I wasn't anywhere close to making millions. In fact, I was making less than I'd ever had in a long time, and I was totally burned out. Mm. And, and my coach said to me at the time, Barbara, you're too into doing. You need time for just being. Yeah. And I knew she was right. And so I took a four-day retreat at a little hotel, two-hour drive from my home. And it was during that period that I looked at these interviews, I reread all of them, and I saw what I had missed. It was like I had been so dazzled by these women's outrageous success and my desire to duplicate it that what I didn't notice was how they were doing it. And they were doing it very differently than, what, than the world, i.e. most men, model. And what I saw is these women were very powerful, but it wasn't the money that gave them power. It was the process of becoming financially successful that empowered them personally. Yeah. One of the biggest things that I learned from you was the, the one sitting still, but two, tell, tell me this, and all the women that you interviewed – why are women, why does it seem like women are so afraid to make money? I mean, when men aren't, what is it for women? What's the hang up? Why are we so afraid to make money? You know, so many of the successful women I've interviewed have said the same thing almost in the same words. Men have been groomed to be successful. That men in the world of work, men walk in the room feeling entitled and sure everybody knows it and is willing to take big risks. Women in the world of work walk in the room feeling flawed mm. or sure everyone knows it and they tend to hold back. So what I see, because the number one requirement for going to the next level in earnings is the willingness to be uncomfortable, the willingness to stretch beyond what feels safe to what seems impossible. Mm -hmm. And this is what men tend to be groomed to do and women tend to be terrified to do. Yes, which <clears throat> your teachings of the soul versus the ego totally transformed my way of thinking. <laughs> How so? How so? I mean, I feel like I had heard people teach something like that before, but I didn't feel, I, I hadn't had it so like laid out, like this is your soul and this is your ego. This is what your soul says to you. And this is what your ego says to you. When I get the, you know, in my head of, you know, you'll, you'll never go past where you're at right now. Or, you know, it's really arrogant for you to think that you can have more. I think a lot of mine too is, you know, I've, I've had so much success in the past, you know, three or four years, um, that starting to feel guilty. Well, when, am, when is enough going to be enough for me? You know, like when, when am I going to finally feel like enough is enough? Um, and finally understanding that it's not about having enough. It's about letting my soul be creative and that I'll always want that creativity. 
and it's okay that it doesn't I, go away. I remember our conversation in the retreat, and I remember telling you, giving you a quote I heard a minister once say in a service that I attended, and it was, be content, but never satisfied. Yes. And it's like, that's what our soul's work is, is to be content with what we have, but always have desires for more. Yeah. And to be feel good with those desires, but not to kill yourself for them. And it's such a relief to know that it's okay to con that you can be content and still have desires. I think that's what yeah. it was for me. It was like a relief. It was like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's okay that I still desire to to be more creative and to continue to do what I'm doing. I don't have to, you know. I think in we, especially more as women, we get into the space in our head that somehow there's virtue in poverty, that, you know, that it's, we're better people if we want less. Yeah, there's, there, there is that. And, and many of the women I work with, and, and I work exclusively with women, but I, I, I'm sure whatever I'm saying applies, I know whatever I'm saying applies to men too, for the most part. But um, it's like money's bad, money's wrong, money is evil. Well, money is neutral. Money is neither bad nor good. It's what your intention is with it. Uh, so I, what I always tell everybody is go out, make lots of money, and if you want, give it away. Because your being poor does not help anybody, does not enrich anybody. Yeah. So I, I think money is like a good lover. <laughs> all money wants to do is serve you and support you. And all it wants in return is to be respected and appreciated. And if we can learn to respect and appreciate money, it will serve us and support us for the rest of our life. Mm. And allow us to serve and support others. For anyone who has the book with them, on page 26 is your conflicting agenda of the ego and the soul. This was really such a game changer for me. So if you're if you, if you get the book later, go come back and listen to this and, and look at page 26. But Barbara, so you talk about what the ego does to us, our voice of fear, and the soul. Let, let, let me just back up a little. Okay. So what I talk about this book, what I realize that the reason. I believe that we women have so much trouble with money. It has nothing to do with money per se. It has far more to do with of our fear of or ambivalence about power mm. because we don't understand power from a feminine perspective. And power comes from the choices we make. And power, there's two sources of power. One is fear and one is love. And depending on which source you plug into, depends on which choices you make, which will create the life you have. Mm -hmm. So fear is ego and love is soul. So the distinction, the, the, the idea that I've learned, and, and all of this comes from A Course in Miracles. While The Course in Miracles don't, doesn't talk about the soul per se. That's the word I have used. Mm -hmm. To me, the soul is like the direct the direct connection with the divine. Mm -hmm. And the ego learned its job when you were very young, and it learned how to keep you safe so you would survive. So the soul doesn't worry about you being safe or surviving because it knows you are. It wants you to shine. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is really important. So when you go into this fear state and you think you pull back to be safe, you realize that's your ego and your ego who, that learned to protect you as a child. So, but what protected you as a child will suffocate you as an adult. Yes, that is, that teaching is really mind blowing for me because I think I think this is common in my generation of women or, or actually any woman who's kind of coming, turning 30, coming into her more for power as a woman. 
is really letting go of that afraid little girl. And you just every, with every year you can let go of that a little bit more. Um, how do you, let me tell you something. I believe, because I'm a lot older than you, <laughs> that little girl never goes away. Yeah. That And everybody I've interviewed has said to me in almost the same words, there's this little girl inside me that just wants to be liked. The key is to be able to make the distinction between that's your scared little girl, but that is not your soul. That is not your adult self. That is not you who are being are on this planet for a purpose and are divinely guided to become the best that you can be. Absolutely. How do you, or do you have, like, I guess, how do you quiet your ego? I don't know if that's the right word. Uh, Ignore uh, your ego or quiet the ego. The, the ego is never quiet. You can't even try. <laughs> if, if you try, that's where people get into addictions. That's where people get into busyness, to drinking, to drugs, to shopping, mm. all those stuff, just trying to calm down, to shut up the ego that is telling you how stupid you are, how, how ineffective you are, how ugly you are, how fat you are, how you'll never amount to anything. That's the ego's job. That's what it does. You will never make it shut up. My, when I wrote this book, my ego was screaming at me the whole time. <laughs> Nobody's going to read this. This is absolute drivel. Why are you writing such junk? You don't even know how to write. The ego would never shut up, and I wow. just had to say thank you for sharing and write it anyway because in my soul, it's what I wanted. So and we talked about this at the retreat. You know, we'll never get over fear. Fear is always there. You have to act in spite of your fear. So you feel like the ego is the same. It's, it's never going to even be quieter. You just have to act in spite of it. The fear comes from the ego. When you are in fear, you are in ego. The two are synonymous. So that fear doesn't go away. The ego doesn't go away. They get quieter. Sometimes they'll turn off for short amounts of time. <laughs> but they never go away. Your, my job has always been to say, to make the distinction in my head, this is my ego talking. This is not truth. The truth comes from my soul. And to get in a place of quiet and stillness. And the trick that I've learned when I go into, I get anxiety. Not, not anxiety attacks, but I do get anxiety a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, a fear, you know, this fear, this foreboding feeling. And what I've learned over the years is I close my eyes and I make that anxiety bigger. I make it bigger. I make it bigger. Instead of resisting it, if you would go into whatever feeling you don't want, go into it and make it bigger, two things will happen. It will either disappear or and or it will tell you what it needs. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about the process. Your, you, everything in your book comes in fours, which I love. You had you said when you were on your, your uh, little sabbatical at the hotel, everything was co coming to you in fours. The call to greatness is stage one. And it's so interesting to me because I don't know if I'm the only one that feels this way or what other people have told you at the retreats. I have struggled a lot with can I really be great? Like understanding the call to greatness is such a hard um, – like I think in my head, and this is what my TEDx talk was about is – well, there's probably only like a finite amount of like small percentage of people who can be great. So why do I think I deserve to be one of them? Which is just a fierce ego talking, I understand. <laughs> it's totally. But no, no, that, that's a really good question. Because I define, I, it's, you know, I thought this very same thing because the what happened is I came to this is when I was on the first day of this retreat and I woke up and I was just feeling like crap about myself. Because here I was trying to make millions and helping women make women make money, and I was doing a terrible job of it myself. And so I got up, and all of a sudden this voice in my head came to me, as clear as my voice is now, and it said, Barbara, go for greatness. Hmm. And it's like, what? I mean, greatness is not even a word I would use. And I, and I, I rushed back to it, and I started journaling about it. And it's like my desire to make millions was coming from my 
ego which needed to validate my worth, to feel important. But what my soul wanted was greatness. And I really sat there and I thought, what is greatness? And I found this quote by Fred Buchner that I'll paraphrase, that greatness is that place where your deep gladness, what you were put on this planet to do, meets the world's deep hunger. Yeah. So basically, greatness is when you are pursuing, your, and this is the definition of sacred success, pursuing your soul's purpose for your own bliss and the benefit of others while being richly rewarded. Which so speaks to the um, online entrepreneurs, and which is a lot of people on this call, people who follow me are online entrepreneurs. Um, I want to read something from page 42. You say, oh, there's a little bit of feedback. I'm going to mute you while I read this and then unmute you. One second. Um, it's, you say, seeking fame and fortune is the quest for external validation to fill an internal void. It's like living on credit, a pretense and illusion, hiding lack and deprivation. Greatness, on the other hand, is the pursuit of meaning and impact living life to the fullest while leaving a legacy for the world, which really, you know, in building an online business, I know a lot of people who are on this webinar and who are listening are, are doing, pursuing the same online type of business that I am. Not everyone, but a lot of you are. And I have battled back and forth in my head quite a bit. Like, you know, I've always known that I should never chase quote unquote fame. Chasing fame definitely never fills a void in your life. But of course we need to grow a platform so that we have an audience to, to talk about. So where is that balance between, um, or how do you find balance between the, the greatness and fame? Do you ever find yourself saying, okay, I have to distinguish, am I trying to be great here or am I trying to be famous? Oh, I think, I let me see if I unmuted you, I'm sorry. Sorry, Barbara, I mute, oh, unmute yourself. <laughs> Uh-oh. I might have muted Barbara, you guys. I unmuted you, Barbara. On your GoToWebinar panel, there's a little green microphone. It might not be green. If it's not green, click. Oh, there you go. Now you're unmuted. Okay. You hear it? Now. Sorry. <laughs> here, here. Okay? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, so that is such a good question you asked. So it's kind of like where we're at when we're doing it. I was writing books. I've been writing books for a long time and writing for a long, long time. I was doing it because I needed to feel important. I was doing it to feel fill a hole in my soul that nothing outside would ever fill. And when I shifted to finding my purpose, and we can talk about that, when I found my purpose, and when I shifted from writing to feel important to pursuing my purpose, and my purpose, I thought, was to empower women about around money. No, that's not my purpose. That's the venue I used mm -hmm. to fulfill my purpose and my purpose is to be a spiritual teacher so suddenly when I was writing this book I'm building my my database I'm talking to people like you to get more exposure but it's coming from a place of I want to be a spiritual teacher I want to bring I want to bring the divine into conversation about the dollar right and so when you come from it, from that purpose, from love instead of fear, it's a whole different energy. Yeah, that's so amazing. Build, build that platform, but do it out of passion and not out of insecurity and scarcity. Yeah, absolutely. I love how you said that your books and, and writing is your vehicle. I really see that with my USANA business as well. People ask me, you know, how I ended up in direct sales and with you saw it, it seems so random. And sometimes I think it's so random, but I know that my purpose is to be a teacher and to show women that there's another way to success. And Sana just happens to be the vehicle that is of choice that is taking me. There. Exactly. You are to me, from the moment I met you, you are a perfect example of, of a, a woman who embodies greatness. Perfect example. Well, and the only thing that gets you off kilter is when you um, when you lose sight of your purpose. Yeah. Now, not just you, all of us. Right. We, we lose sight of our purpose and we go into scarcity and lack. 
that's when we when I get in trouble. Yeah, me too. It's when I become very, very um, an like anxious and really short tempered. Yeah, yes. <laughs> which is not the way I want to be. <laughs> so what was different for me writing this book is I always had my ego in every book, in every article, in everything I've read, ever written, telling me that I'm stupid and no one will read it and I'm a terrible writer. That's always been there. But mm. this time, it didn't cause me so much angst because I write, wait a minute. I'm spreading the word. I'm being a, I'm being a teacher, and this is why I'm doing this. Yeah. Because there is another way to look at money, and there is another way to look at power. The the title of your book, Sacred Success, is so perfect because it's you know you you feel like going into it on a surface level, it's about money, but really what you're talking is about how it's it's just our all of our our internal shit that we need to get over so that we can actually get to a point where we can make money. <laughs> and I remember at the retreat, one of the women um, kind of at the end, she was so grateful for everything. I don't know if you remember this. And she said, well, I don't understand where the financial miracles are. And I think by that point in the retreat, I had forgotten oh, yeah. that you are even a money teacher because I felt like in such a spiritually high place. <laughs> um, do you really think that, the, you know, that the money stuff is is easy to teach and it's really just the spiritual stuff that we need to grow in? I think it's both a practical process and a spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. And I think it's by combining those. I see financial success as a three-pronged process. The outer work of wealth, the inner work of wealth, and the higher work of wealth. And the outer work is the practical stuff, knowing the difference between a stock and a bond, understanding savings and getting out of debt, and all those practical things, which are really important. Mm -hmm. But for me, where I got, but I get stuck there. I get stuck. I, I would I read something financially, my eyes would glaze over, my brain would fog up. I just had all kinds of problems. That's when I realized I needed the inner work. That's in understanding your beliefs, your attitudes, and decisions you've made about yourself and money. And that's when it really unlocked my ability to to, it, it allowed me to really understand money in a much deeper way. But what motivated me, and what I believe motivates most people, at least women, and many enlightened men, is, is the higher work, which mm -hmm. is the opportunity to do what you're on this planet to do and use your money as a tool for transformation. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. People ask me so often, I mean, I'm most known for my blog, obviously, and people always ask me, Liz, how do you get paid for blogging? And I just always laugh and say, you know, there's no magic blogging God paying me. <laughs> I don't get paid for blogging, but I know that I can live my purpose through my use on a team and get paid in, this, in, in a certain way. So it really is just like the spiritual, I know I can have a purpose, but I actually have to have a check coming to my bank account as well. <laughs> Of course, and and I I write in my book, which I was I kept taking this line in and out because I was terrified, it would seem blasphemous, but I finally kept it in. And it's interesting because Publishers Weekly, which is like the bible of the publishing world, Publishers Weekly gave me a very good gave this book a very good review, mm. and it used this line in the first sentence of its review. Wow! And I said I believe that money is God made visible. That money is simply a tool that allows us to live our best life, to serve others and play full out. Because you can't be of service to others. You can't live a full life if you are drowning in debt and struggling to make ends meet. It's yeah. just not going to happen. Absolutely. And that's the, the basis of when I'm, when I'm talking to people about joining my youth on a team. And and talking about making money in the beginning when it felt uncomfortable, I, it wasn't exactly how you just said it because I didn't know not yet, but I'd always just say you can't live a purpose if you're worried about paying your rent and you know paying the electric bill every month. Like that eats that, up so much energy, right. you just can't do it. And I have this quote in the book from Michael Beckwith, the, the, uh, he, he was in The Secret and he's the head of the Agape Church in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And he says, how can you be the light of the world if you can't pay your light bill? Yeah. yeah. 
So anyone? So I, I think. Oh, go ahead. I, I think. I think the work you're doing. And, and I, I mean, I'm a Usana user. I I I don't sell it, but I consume it. I'm a, a Usana consumer. Yes. And I was so yes. excited when I first met. Uh, I forget who it was. Well, I guess it was Deborah who who uh, I I go through. Nice. And this was like wonderful. These vitamins and these packets. I love it. <laughs> it's so it was like such a gift to me. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I'm looking at page 43 of your book and just talking about greatness. I just wanted to cover one more thing. And then we can take some questions. But so many people, women especially, when they start a new venture or they start to dabble in something, they start to feel so uncomfortable and gross and yucky and kind of twisted and, and restless and disconnected and, and all this stuff. And you say this so well here. You say most like me misinterpret the signs or ignore them completely with regards to greatness. And then you say perhaps you've been feeling disconnected, restless, anxious, unfulfilled, frustrated, bored, or burnt out. These are all signs that greatness is calling you. And again, that, to me, that's such a relief. You know, we get so afraid when we're feeling all of that. And it's just such a relief to know that, oh, no, that's just greatness calling you. <laughs> yeah, because what these signs all have in common is discomfort. Mm -hmm. And this course says discomfort is aroused only to bring attention for the need for correction. So when we start having the computer breakdown or we get these headaches or we start feeling unhappy, or this like nagging, nagging feeling there's something more. That is just our soul calling us. And what it's saying is stop what you're doing. Pay attention. It's time to play a bigger game. Yeah. yeah. Play a bigger game. It just says it so well. <laughs> we just, we're so afraid to play a bigger game. And I really, Barbara, your work, work is so phenomenal. This book, helps so many women play a bigger game. We're doing a book club in my team right now, and you should see the comments are, are off the charts. It really is. Anyone who's listening to this webinar, I just so highly encourage you to buy this book as soon as possible. Um, and really, if you can form a group with three or four or however many friends, even if it's long distance, read this book with some other women. I think that the the, the commentary, the comments and the, the discussion you can have around it are really game changing for women. So Barbara, thank you, thank you, thank you for writing this book for us. Oh honey, thank you for reading it. Thank you for spreading the word. I just so love it. And I wanna to mention too, we'll take a couple of questions. You guys, if you have a question, use your go-to webinar panel and um, we'll take a couple of questions. But I also wanna mention, I went, for, before I read this book and the way I met Barbara was at her Sacred Success Retreat. And I feel like it's incredibly important especially if you're in business for yourself, but even if you're not, just for all women, to attend at least one retreat or some kind of spiritual growth um, seminar or something at least once a year. And I so, so highly recommend that Sacred Success is, is on your list to do very soon. She only does two a year, one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast. And I know you can find all this on her website is barbarastanley.com. We'll send everyone who registered for this an email so you guys can have it. But um, Barbara, your your East Coast one is in June, and is that in Baltimore? It, my East Coast one is, I think it's the last weekend in May, mm. and that is in Baltimore. And my Sacred Success is in September, and that's in Seattle. And if you're interested, go to my website, Barbara Stanny, S T A N N Y dot com, and there's, the dates should be there. Okay. But you only do two a year, right? Have you ever thought about adding more? Uh, sure, if I could fill them. I mean, they just they just started. The last four I've done, and I've been doing them for four years. Mm -hmm. The last four I've done, so that last since last year they've been selling out. But before then they 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 weren't. So I may I may add another one on. I also do two overcoming under earning teleclasses a year. So that's over the phone. Oh, yes. I'm so glad that you mentioned that. I wanted to mention that as well because you, you have your three stages, survival to stability, stability to affluence. I really feel like sacred success can help all of those. But if anyone who's listening to this, you feel like you're more, you need the survival to stability. I wanted to mention that too on Barbara's website. Like you said, Barbara, you do that telecourse kind of for that first level. And then once people feel stable, 
is the sacred success retreat. So I'm really glad you mentioned that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, what surprised me is how many, I think I even said this in the retreat, how many women go to the sacred success retreat and then sign up for overcoming under earning. Mm -hmm. Because truly in sacred, to, to really, to really pursue your purpose in the greatest, grandest way possible, you need to have a really solid financial foundation. You don't need to be wealthy. You don't need to be a Rockefeller or a Bill Gates or an Oprah, but you do need to have a solid foundation so that money is no longer a source of stress or distraction, but as I said earlier, a tool for transformation. Yeah, yeah. which is, people need so much. Need so much. There's a couple of questions here. Um, Bay asks, or B asks, she says, I'd love to ask Barbara, how do you respect money? You respect money. Oh. Good question, whoever asked that. You respect money by following the four rules of money. And they are in this order. Spend less, save more, invest wisely, and give generously. In that order, we women, we got the yes. giving generously yeah. part down pat. <laughs> but giving generously without the first three, without spending less, saving more, and investing wisely, is always an act of self-sabotage. Because not only do you jeopardize your own future security, but you diminish the impact you can make with your money. I love how you talk so, about focused giving, Barbara. Mm, that I, I learned that when I started interviewing women who are smart with money, that to, it, it used to be that I, I, I mean, I, I would give and I would drop my pennies into the, the, those plastic boxes at the supermarket and give a little bit here and give a little bit there. But I understood, but then I learned from women who are financially savvy that it's so much more powerful when you are very clear on where you want to give and how much you want to give. Mm -hmm. And you give to those places, especially when your money is combined with other monies, that's what's going to change the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we have another question um, here from Melissa. How do you know what your greater purpose is? Well, my shameless marketing answer would be <laughs> read my book. <laughs> but, I agree with that. Um, but the, but I'll give you another answer. Everyone knows their purpose. I believe everyone knows their purpose, but maybe not consciously. I believe that we aren't quiet enough and reflective enough to take the time to search for it. And one of the one of the lines I had in my Prince Charming book that the editor thought was corny and took out um, was, in our greatest pain lies our highest purpose. And I know money has given me the most pain, but in there was my higher purpose. So one place to look is where you've, where you've had pain. Another place to look is what did you love to do as a child? What did you aspire to as a child? Another way is Ask yourself a question. If you could have anybody's job in the whole world, not being realistic, anybody's job in the whole world, who, whose would it be? And I remember when I first did this, I thought, I would be Neil Diamond. <laughs> and the reason I so admired Neil Diamond is because he, and this was, so this is ages me, this is when he's popular. Uh, Neil Diamond, because he wrote his songs and sung them. Now, I can't sing. But that's when I, that's what helped me see that I wanted to write books and teach. Mm. So there's all kinds of questions in the book and all kinds of questions you can ask yourself. But the important thing is to take the time to commune with your soul, which is the keeper of your purpose. And I'll tell everyone on the call, one of the, the biggest learnings I had from Barbara was um, Barbara, I'm gonna, you don't need to mute yourself, but I'm going to mute you while I talk because someone just commented that they're getting a lot of feedback um, when I talk. What I wanted to say, though, is that um, one of the biggest 
ahas that I had in the work that I've done with Barbara is that I need more silence in my life so that I can actually hear my soul talking. I used to, like when I would exercise, I would just blast music. Even when I would hike, when I would, you know, do cardio, when I'd lift weights, whatever, whatever I do, even at yoga class, they play music. And I've been craving silence and I have been doing all of my exercise in silence. And I can really actually hear what my soul wants to tell my, my heart and my head, which is so important. I even, um, I drove a few hours from my hometown to Bozeman, um, a couple of weeks ago. And normally when I drive, especially I do talk radio or I do music or I do something. And, um, I just drove almost the whole way in silence. So I think just learning to, you know, you don't have to meditate for two hours a day, but even in some activities that you do, learning to be in silence, you can actually hear what your soul wants. Barbara, I just unmuted you. Oh, Liz, while you were saying that, I had the biggest smile on my face. Mm -hmm. It's like my hand was on my heart. I'm thinking, oh, yes, that's beautiful. What a good role model you are. And I, because I know that was, that's not easy for you. No. No. Silence. Yeah. We can take one more question. Does anybody else have a question? Type it into your GoToWebinar panel. This is your chance. You've got Barbara herself. Okay, hold on. I got to read it. Ooh, this is such a good one to end on. Barbara, in your journey to greatness, hold on. What's going on here? Okay. I want, to read. I want to make sure that I do this correctly. Hold on. I just muted Barbara so um, I could keep the line clear. For some reason, we've got feedback. I'm not sure why, guys. Sorry about that. Um, but here's the last question. And for those of you asking, yes, we are going to, I am going to send out the recording of this. Barbara, in your journey to greatness, can you talk about the people that you surround yourself with and the impact that that has had? You know, that's um, that's a really good question. Who asked that? Shannon. Shannon. Shannon, that is a really good question. Because I, because there is this fact that we become who we're with. We become who we hang out with. And we women are so relationship oriented that, and I saw this in overcoming under earning. When I wrote my book and I interviewed everyone who had been through my workshops and some came in under earners and they left under earners. They might have had a ha ha. And the others came in under earners and they became remark remarkably high earners. And the biggest difference was, I remember asking one woman who had accomplished so much after the workshop. She wrote her book, she got out of debt. She and her husband had just re completely restructured their finances, but she couldn't make more money. And I said to her, what would your, I don't know why I even asked this question, what would your friends think if you made more money? And she said, oh my God, they'd freak out. <laughs> they'd freak <laughs> out. <laughs> They're all tree huggers, she said. <laughs> and, and I realized, and I started seeing this theme that it's very important that you surround yourself with cheerleaders, with people that are cheering you on. They don't necessarily have to be on the same journey. They could just be supporting you. They could, you don't, you may not even know them, just having role models. But it's really important to have those role models, to have examples, and to have support, especially for women. And so, I've been blessed to meet some really extraordinary people, men and women, and to have some really extraordinary friends. And that's made all the difference. Barbara, if you could, if you have any examples, how do you, I don't know if this is the right word, but friendly, weed out people who you know are, are not contributing to your greatness? Oh, but that's another good question. It's really now. This is what this is what I learned. When I interviewed six-figure women that as they moved up the salary ladder, which had nothing to do with money, but as they grew as human beings, because it's who you have to become to make more money, they often lost people in their lives, and this 
happens and it can be very painful. But when you change, those that are close to you, they have to change or they will leave. Because it, your change is in their face and if they're too scared to change, it's, it's too hard for them to be around it. So what I recommend is you eliminate, if not eliminate, minimize the time you spend around those people who aren't supportive. And uh, I probably shouldn't say that, but I'm going to. Um, there are certain people in my family who are not very supportive of me. Mm. And they're good people, and I love them, but I've had to really minimize the time I spend with them, really whittle it down. And I, I, I make sure that I, I, I spend most of my time on the phone or in person with people who are really cheering me on, who are on their a journey similar to mine. Or if they're not, they really understand me. Yeah. yeah. Hold on, I muted Barbara for a second so I can say this. Barbara, what you just said helped, I think it helped me so much and it helped every single woman in the, on the planet when you said that there are even certain people potentially in your family who aren't supporting you because I know from my perspective and from everyone on this call, we think like, how could someone not support someone who does the work that you do when you're, you know, you've been on like every famous TV show, you've written all of these books, you know, you, you have such this huge platform and you're really doing work that's changing women's lives. And even you have people in your family who you feel like aren't supporting you. And I think so many women feel like, um, oh, I'm the only one who doesn't have the support. So thank you for sharing that. I got two divorces. <laughs> I had two husbands and I had to divorce because they didn't support me. Yeah. And I'm really glad that the third time was a charm and I found someone who does. Yeah. Your husband's yeah. awesome. <laughs> Your husband's awesome. Oh, he is. Thank you. But, but it's really honoring yourself by drawing to you, attracting to you, going out and finding, playing in the same space where the people you want to become play. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, so much good stuff in this webinar. Anything else you want to add, Barbara? I think sacred success, and this is what I found very profound, because I thought in order to be really successful, and of course really successful means more than whatever I'm, level I'm at now, you'd have to like work nonstop, it'd just be like crazy making, it would be insane, it would be intense. And what I found was something so different that these, it, it evolves in stages, and the stages are the call to greatness, as we spoke about, where you feel where something's not right, and you step back into surrender. So you can have time in stillness, maybe just for a few moments, maybe longer, so you can commune with your soul and see what it has to say to you. And then when you're ready, you go out in disciplined action. And disciplined action doesn't come from pushing and striving, but from what I say, thoughtful pruning, setting your priorities, doing what's important to you. And eventually, <laughs> You'll be in discipline that you'll be in action when you'll get the call again and you will step back just for a little bit and surrender. And it's a dance between the doing and the surrendering, the doing and the surrendering. And that gets you ever closer to the fourth stage, which is the whole point of sacred success. That means modeling greatness by leaving a legacy. And so what I want to leave everybody with is to really give serious thought to the legacy you want to leave, not just the business you want to build, but how you want to be remembered, the footprint you want to leave on this planet. Mm, that's so, so, so beautiful. Barbara, I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to send this recording to everyone who registered and to you, obviously, but if there's anything I can do for you, let me know. And, and just thank you so much. I just, I honor you and your teaching so much. Thank you for being here. And thank you for having me. And Thank you so much. You're so Keep welcome. up the good work, Liz. Thank you. Thank All you. right, you guys, have an excellent night. A lot to think about.